Hi, everybody. Hi, Christian. Thank you for joining us. And I'm just going to unmute everybody so you can all do this. Uh, hey, Maya, there you are. Hey, Mike. And we'll see Christian. Do we see Christian? And there's Neil. All right. So um, we'll just do Hollywood squares here. And um, so today we have hopefully a short-ish meeting. I don't know. Maybe. Um, I'm going to share my screen and we'll hold on, start sharing my screen. And so Vadim has said he's going to be a little bit late. Um, and I will find my working group notes. This is right in the way. So. So welcome everybody. Happy Tuesday. And um, this is the OKD working group meeting. Um, if you're in the wrong place, stay anyways, because um, we like the company. Um, today, what um, we have a proposed agenda. I put the link to the attendee meeting notes um, thing. If you could add your names into that, that would be helpful. Um, I also, um, Maya is here, who is the person who I mentioned last week had the um, IoT ARM64 um, questions use case. Um, so uh, I was going to use this time to also ask her to uh, explain a little bit about what she's looking to do and what she needs. Um, but first, you want to walk us through an update on OKD4? Um, Christian and where we're at and then the road to the release um, and um, I'm apologizing yes. for saying July 9th to you and making you panic the other day um, I've been watching watching <laughs> no, no worries paying close enough attention so cool so take it away um, so yeah I think Vadim isn't here yet um, but yeah what Vadim has done uh, is we've updated the nightly builds to be based off of um, 4.5. So new nightlies um, are actually built from the master code now. Um, and that's on the way ramping up to, to the actual 4.5 OCP release, which will be uh, basing off, uh, which will be, be using OKGGA to, yeah, as a base for. Uh, so um, everything should, all the platforms should work. Uh, I think we have uh, an issue with GCP currently, but um, which will be resolved. It's an it's an own issue, and um, that sort of got lost in the latest rebase. But what what's new is the vSphere IPI install path. So um, I'd like to ask anybody who has access to a vSphere environment to use uh, to to test that out. Uh, with the new nightly builds. Um, I think the next beta, which would be beta 6, I think, is also on its way, which um, it's either already been released or is going to be released very shortly. Um, yeah, and um, we're still on our way to, to releasing OKDGA very soon. So we'll, we'll have to wait for OCP uh, 4.5, the release, which is, I'm not sure if that's a publicly available that I'll, I'll just say it I think we're aiming for a release um, on July 13th and um, OKDGA is expected to be released a few days after that so yeah not far from now okay yeah, and great. that is um, I think it for the update from my side okay. does, does wow we have a real date well that's a real as real as it gets okay so yeah. like We've, we've been here before, um, so, you know, don't, you know, I, I, have a little, I have a lot of faith this time around because there's a lot of other people saying that same date, but um, we'll, we'll see. And um, I, I'm pretty sure. It's, it's not, it's, okay, DGA is not going to happen on the 13th of July, I think. Um, uh, why that's not? When, okay, that's OCP 4.5 um, GA, and then we have to uh, backport yeah. A few comments uh, from master onto the release 4.5 branch, making that the the F cost 4.5 branch. Um, so yeah, it's it's going to be July 13th plus a few days, a few very short days, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, we I think there's also some requirements on Fedora CoreOS that we just uh, you know 
realize were super important. Um, so it might take into account some Fedora Core OS release schedule as well. Fedora Core OS doesn't have a release schedule. It just makes snapshots every two weeks. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's the goal every two weeks, but we, uh, we have a change that we need to land um, that we, in other words, there's a change that we need to make that we don't want OKD to have to release GA and then make that change for their users, right? Uh, it would be more smooth for OKD if the GA included the change. I can link to it in the BlueJeans chat as well. That, sure. That would be great. Yeah, just, just to put put a, a sort of a topic to that issue, that is the, uh, the naming of the um, Ethernet interfaces. We've been using the old schema in FCOS so far with ETH0 and so forth, uh, while RCOS and the new scheme is actually would, would actually be ENS192. So we'll be releasing OKDGA hopefully with that new naming scheme uh, without actually breaking um, old installs. That's at least our goal. Um, yeah, I hope we can promise. Uh, well, I hope we can actually do that. Um, but yeah. We want to get that fixed in FCOS before we do GA. All right. So as we said, um, it's all it's all relative um, to dates. So don't don't worry too. Don't worry. I'm just going to do that. So um, so I'm just going to put in. Uh, I'm not sharing my screen again. I apologize. Trying to see who that was talking because Dusty, I didn't recognize your name right off the bat. Your your voice. Um, yep, that's me, Dusty. Dusty. I just wanted to highlight to Bruce had a question in chat here about is there is there a pointer to the vSphere instructions or are those just part of the installer instructions? Elmiko, could you say that again? Oh, sorry. I just wanted to highlight Bruce's question from a few minutes ago. Make sure we don't lose it. Is yeah. there a pointer to the vSphere instructions? Someone can someone dig that up and share it in the the note. My connection seems to be a bit wonky. I. I didn't get the the question again. One um, more I'll, I'll just uh, yeah, <laughs> please. It's it's that is there documentation on docs.okdio about doing IPI vSphere? And that's a good question. So let's just go take a look. Doesn't look like it actually. I I looked on the I don't see. That might be, uh, just go on to look. Um, so I think we're actually sharing the documentation with the OCP latest and there's on the, at least on the source side and there's only a few things like the, the OS naming that are different. So even if they're not there, um, <laughs> the vSphere IPI uh, should work exactly as the OCP um, vSphere IPI install. It's just uh, that you'd have to reference or use the, the different installer binary or build it from the FCOS branch um, and put in, well, yeah, the, the actual image references in the, in the JSON file in installer should be, um, should already be updated. Um, so uh, Joseph, to answer your question on Azure, um, there hasn't been any progress that I'm aware of um, and it's still, Sort of blocked on the Fedora side to get us um, get the images up uploaded to Azure, um, and we won't be blocking the GA release on on Azure availability. Um, and Mike's question: um, Yes, the the aim, the goal is to get rid of the FCOS branches eventually. Um, that will probably happen sometime after GA, though. Um, so in the 4.6 release. Uh, we, we hope we don't need FCOS branches anymore. Uh, for 4.5, we will have, um, yeah, we'll have that on the FCOS branch. 
um, our yeah our releases because we will actually use release 4.5 branch and then we still have to backport a few uh, commits which by then will be merged into master already so at least on the MCO side in 4.6 we won't be needing the branch anymore in 4.5 we will still need it the installer is still a little bit more on the unclear about when we can get rid of the branch but that's um yeah we're not blocking ga on that and it should also happen quite soon i expect in the 4.6 uh, time frame some some time or 4.7 at the latest but that's not not really yeah it, it's not a blocker and yeah any other question and who was the person who was asking for the vSphere link um I'm not sure I gave you the right one, but um, it was the one that I found searching. And you can all, I apologize, everybody. I can't see the chat questions when I'm sharing my screen, which is why I keep popping back and forth, which I'm sure. Yeah, that's why I mentioned it. That was Bruce, by the way. Yeah, I, I was asking just because I do have a vSphere uh, and uh, uh, I'm working with the IT services people to uh, go through the. Uh, the native installation parts uh, I, I installed using uh, bare metal, uh, having created the virtual machine. So I know that works. Okay, cool. All right, well, um, hopefully we can get some vSphere stuff going. So um, I don't see Vadim, is Vadim on here yet? I think he's still locked up into uh, planning meetings for the day. So I'm gonna say um, he's not, a, he's a no-show for today. Um, I, uh, in in light of the June 13th and perhaps June, July, not July 13th, I get ahead of myself of time, um, perhaps July 15th release date of the GA, I, the following week, um, whatever that Monday is, I think maybe another one of the OKD AMA sessions, if people are available for it. Um, so I'll tentatively put us all back on the, on the hook for um, a GA party on um, whatever the following Monday is there. So I'm just looking at my calendar. That would be July 20th. Um, I think, I don't think I've booked anybody there. On the 13th, we, we were supposed to this week have an FCOS one, but our, um, we had, had a, um, a snafu in the matrix um, on Monday with live streaming. So um, for the AMAs, I like to make sure everything's live streamed. So um, we're going to reschedule the FCOS one. I have them booked for July 13th. So we may, if we may be able to go ta-da or something on the 13th, but I'm not counting on that. But so you all should have um, invites in, um, or the primaries on that all should have invites in your inbox for the 13th, including Christine, Christian and Vadim, who I want on the call if you can. Um, so we can say how wonderful FCOS is and how dependent we are on them. Um, and um, then- And Dusty too, who's on the Dusty, call today. Yeah, Dusty's on the um, the FCOS one, Brent, um, Ben Beard and I, Colin Wal Walters um, have all been invited too. So we'll see if they all make it. Um, and that's a pretty loose format. Dusty's just gonna give an, an overview on what FCOS is and why. Um, and maybe a little bit about the release cycle. I'll see if I can get Ben and Colin to do a little song and dance as well. And then we'll just open up for Q&A. Um, and that's the format for whatever we do on the 20th besides throwing up some balloons and you know, announcing using Joseph's re reworked um, uh, logo for us um, and figuring out some stickers or something. So that's, um, that's the great news and a blog post, of course. So there's there's all that. So today um, I did manage to get um, one person who ha had the use case to join us um, that I talked about last time, the ARM64 use case. Um, so Maya, um, if you could, if we're okay with that, Christian, I'd love to have Maya explain the use case and what she's looking for for her IoT um, project. If Meyer, if your game, take it away. Yeah, yeah, <clears throat> no worries. Um, a little, little background. Um, I've been working with a company that does retail analytics for two years. So, who's in the stores? What are they paying attention to? How do we grab their attention? 
um, controlling content on digital signage. So you get 18 to 24 year olds walk up, you show them content relevant relevant to them and so on and so forth. Um, we've seen increases in sales and so on. Um, the main problem was is that it's running in Android, which is absolutely awful for doing anything. Um, and I've finally gotten my client off of Android and into the idea of um, Linux um, and taking the monolithic Android app, which was a pain to maintain, and creating you know all the little bits and pieces so we have a camera input, and then we have a, an age detection, gender detection, attention span, and so on and so forth. So we have you know, a whole bunch of, of inputs being processed by a bunch of outputs, talking to the CMS. And it just seems like it's, oh, right, this is a microservices containerized sort of architecture thing. Um, and it's, it's a bit more powerful than your, your typical IoT thing. This, this is the device that we run on that I've spent two years designing. Um, it's got a six core ARM64 on it with um, four gigabytes of RAM. So it's, it's no slouch in terms of, of power. Um, we can also add uh, Google's TPU module to it or an FPGA if you need a specific um, bit of processing for a very specific app. Um, and the I mean, one of the one of the problems with Android, um, well, exists in both cases, is how do you manage a fleet of not just ten of these, but say ten thousand of them? Um, we do have um, one customer, one client customer that has thirty-eight thousand retail locations worldwide. Um, you know, we're we're rolling out twenty-five of them in the next month, um, and making sure that we can we can handle a a large scale or you know, very wide um, network of devices is, is something that's really important to us. One of the reasons we're on ARM is simply that Intel and AMD are too expensive. Um, and um, one of our direct competitors is now actually uh, one of our customers because their device costs 10 times um, ours. Um, and we spent a lot of money doing the cost optimization. Um, so you know, getting it on ARM, getting it lower powered, um, still being able to provide all the services and things that we want, you know, this is this is like okay, we take an architecture that is containable, is designable, scriptable, and all the rest of it, and we drop it on each unit, and then we drop it on a thousand units or whatever, um, and to have a, um, a server side management console. This is right, all of the all of the uh, devices in Washington State. We're going to run a campaign in Washington State, so you you click on all the devices in Washington State, you update their configuration, it pushes out functionality or content or whatever, um, and you can do national campaigns or, or um, regional stuff. The other thing that we've discovered you know, by designing this architecture is that now actually, instead of just being a retail um, focused infrastructure, we can apply it to a whole bunch of other businesses where security is important, uh, privacy is important, uh, we're subject to GDPR rules in, in the UK. Um, I can't afford 20 million per data breach. Um, so keeping everything properly locked down. Um, I've been chatting with Peter Robinson, who does a lot of the arm work for Fedora. Um, and we've got a trusted platform module in there, so we can uh, completely encrypt and own the boot chain. So we only run signed images. Only images that we sign can run on the device. Um, our images can't run on anybody else's device, and so on and so forth. So it's designed with security and privacy from the outset and to be as flexible as we can possibly make it. Um, so the camera is just one input. We've also um, um, been prototyping and playing with some millimeter wave radar. So in the retail space, if you have um, shop displays up, you can't see through them or the camera can't see them through them. But the radar system can, so you have a better idea of occupancy count based on different types of sensors and things like that. Um, and yeah, we've we just started with ARM because one, it runs Android better. Two, it's less expensive. So we're you know we're at a cost per unit of about two two fifty. And if you look at Nooks or even AMD's offering, their devices start at that. Um, we've integrated um, a 4G modem. 
Uh, we've got Wi-Fi, we've got Ethernet, we've got power over Ethernet. So we've really made this thing as easy as like stick it to a wall, plug it in and turn it on however you can and it just goes. Um, so to have that, um, you know, just turn it on and go and plug and playness of it requires a lot of sort of back end coordination. Um, but, you know, having the device register itself on the network the first time, do all of its bootstrapping, load its default configuration, all of that fun stuff. Um, is stuff that I never want to do manually ever again. So, um, that's basically where we're at. Um, looking at the suite of tools and following um, OKD, um, OpenShift, uh, all the operator frameworks, um, all the, the sort of let's ditch Docker in favor of something more secure. Um, you know, these are all the things that have been have been drawing me to. OpenShift and OKD, and, and Diane and I have been loosely talking about this for a couple of years. Um, and um, now we're finally at a point where it's like, right, I need um, some infrastructure set up. Um, I need some people who can set up the, the, you know, the cloud side of it that will, you know, um, set up and execute and deploy hundreds or thousands of units at once. Um, some added bonus problems, uh, VPNs for, you know, 10,000. Uh, remote systems doesn't work very well, um, so like communications and, and things like that. So there's a few um, challenges left to be had, but it looks like um, from a starting point, OKD is the sort of collection of tools um, that should make it as easy as possible, apart from the fact that it mainly runs on x86 uh, and not ARM64. Um, the underlying OS um, uh, Container Linux looks like the best thing, but the last time I saw anything ARM64 related uh, dated back to 2015. Um, so it's it's getting really getting a, an ARM64 build of it, and then we're ready to to Hoover it up and and go. Um, also, in terms of um, the weight of it, we don't need the full K8s um, distribution and all the extra features. K3 looks far more attractive because it's just like, it's just what we need to run. And because we are building walled silos and walled gardens, we can control what does and doesn't need to, to be supported in that. Um, so the OKD for IoT, uh, which is sort of a dangerous name, I think OKD Lite is probably safer. I, um, I love OKD idiots, okay? I mean, I want the t-shirt, so I'm just... I'm just saying. Okay. I'm, 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 I'm happy to wear the T-shirt too, but uh, some people may not get it. Um, so just having a lighter weight version of all the stuff that runs, you know, in big heavyweight data center instances to be able to run on, you know, ARM64 devices with a couple of gigabytes of RAM, you know, 16 gigabytes of storage, and still manage to do everything that we want to do. So that's it in a large nutshell. So, Any questions or? So there's lots of lots of questions. I think from from my perspective, um, one um, getting a compiled OKD that runs on ARM64 architecture is a is a is a a blocker, um, and it does sound like fun. Um, but uh, and as well as what it what like really understanding better what it is about like k3 um what's what we would have to slice off of um okd to make a, a k3 thing so um i'm gonna unmute um because i can see vadim has joined us um so if people have opinions i have opinions i'm tired of mine i would i i asked maya to come to share it here be so that um some more technical um insights might be able to uh, join this this conversation so Please, Christian. So I, I may just um, maybe because uh, Container Linux was mentioned. Uh, so the successor to Container Linux is Fedora CoreOS, which we are basing OKD on. Um, so that's that's great. Um, and then there's also um, so for the use case, I'm I'm not sure whether it does sound to me that maybe Kubernetes isn't really needed in that. If it's like sensors and stuff for yeah uh, that are that run on in on all the machines anyway, 
uh, it's maybe more of a provisioning thing. Um, you don't, and for me, Kubernetes is needed when when you need this scheduling of workloads across many machines. Um, if all the machines run the same workload anyways, you don't really need it, maybe. And then um, Fedora IoT, uh, which Peter Robinson does, um, may be a great alternative there because um, they they also have a, a provisioning system in place with uh, the ignition, um, ignition configuration, which we also use for OKD and OCP. Um, and they have a service called Zezire um, to to do that, to sort of have one one server that um, can provision uh, machines with a with a given config, um, because well, yeah, I think it uh, because yeah, I think we're a bit further off uh, of a real uh, OpenShift on ARM right now, just because of the resource constraints we have. Um, most ARM devices won't support it, and we can't just um, make OpenShift a new K3S by, by ripping out pieces. Um, at least not that easily, not that it's never gonna happen, but um, that's not a sh thing we can achieve in the short term, I think. Um, but yeah, it does sound like a very interesting project and um, I'm, I'm definitely willing to help uh, help with anything there. And I think the first step we can we can actually do is get all the parts built on, on the ARM architecture. And then even if there's no machines that really can run them, um, you could, yeah, at least uh, try to, to run them or uh, virtualize that or, yeah, stuff like that. Um, and Vadim may, may know more here as well. Vadim, I think I have you unmuted. So if you want to try speaking. Yeah, that sounds like an incredibly interesting project. Um, if I understood correctly, Fedora IoT works on that device, so we could use it instead of Fedora Core OS. Later on, it would be just a matter of building a payload, and we can reuse OCP binaries, the majority of them, because well, due to license constraints, some packages still have to be rebuilt. Um, but given a large build farm, that can be done. And once we got there, a mass installation would be the tricky part. If the devices have IPMI or any kind of a remote uh, control interface supported by Ironic, we could use bare metal IPI schema to massively provision a lot of instances and make them join the cluster like we do with the standard machines. Um, that would be very impressive. And eventually, the all of the clusters we create, we could use um, a, um, open cluster management or whatever the thing is now called uh, from IBM to control various clusters and use Cube Federation to move workloads between them and, and tweak them. So that pretty much um, solves all the issues, uh, except it needs to be done. Uh, the, the tricky part would be getting Fedora IoT on that devices. So if, if that works, that would be a very huge boost. Once we're done, we could prepare uh, payload of the OKD, stripped of several operators, for instance, uh, you probably don't need telemetry. You probably don't need operator hub. Um, you can get away with a single Prometheus per cluster, and so on and so forth. We have a set of instructions how to do that, but I don't think it says actually being tried right now yeah so i mean i think there's a few things that we could do probably the first is we actually publish some sort of lightweight guide to like hey if you happen to have resource constraint uh, a resource constrained um you know hardware setup what are the things that are optional right i think that's valuable for anybody who's not even trying to do this um in maya's case on 
ARM boards with four gigabytes of uh, memory. So I think that'd be valuable. Uh, regarding Fedora Core OS, we do have a plan to actually support AR64 hardware. We don't have a plan to support 32-bit ARM, but it sounds like you're already on AR64, so you're good there, right? Um, yeah, and we have unofficial builds right now, um, but we obviously want to bring the other architectures under the, the official um, build pipeline and produce those at the same cadence that we do the others. So we have a plan to get there. I'm just not sure what your time horizon is on it. Um, well, I'm a customer. I want it yesterday. <laughs> of course. Uh, I, have, uh, I have a question uh, for Maya. Uh, <laughs> and I think I think this kind of I I think we shouldn't overlook what Christian said about you know is Kubernetes the right tool for the right job here? But do you do you predict like meeting the features that Kubernetes is adding? Because like I I'm struggling to think like I wouldn't I wouldn't think you'd want to put all these devices into a single cluster, which means would they be single node clusters? And then the question is, well, what what are you really getting out of that? Like, could could you just use a container runtime and a nice secure operating system to, you know, to achieve That's, the same thing, basically? I, I so I think one of the core problems here is that um, without OpenShift today, we don't actually have a story for provisioning any of these systems at scale, like at all. Period. The la the only tool we kind of had for this is being EOL'd right now because uh, so once that once pulp 2 is EOL'd, we actually have no way of mirroring RPM OS tree or OS trees at all. We have no way of pushing them out at scale. We have no way of replicating them. We have no way of easily provisioning them. And we have no way of tracking those provisioning. Right now, all of that is built into the MCO, which essentially traps you into using OpenShift to do this, even though it's the wrong tool for this whole workload case. So like, Neil, Neil, just so, so yeah, maybe two. Just stop for a second. Just yeah, I think um, Christian already mentioned the. I, I'm going to say it wrong. Uh, the Fedora IoTs Cizer Cizer. Oh, that that does Desiree. some. Uh, the the weird name that I can't say. Um, that thing does limited provisioning for it. It's not quite to I think the extent that that Maya is asking for. Um, but it could be evolved to do so. We still don't have the replication or the locality things that are required to make that actually efficient. Right now, this actually automatically happens when you have OpenShift clusters and you're deploying them because it will replicate the OS tree payloads within the infra nodes and then deploy them to all of the worker nodes um, and then reschedule them and bring them up and stuff like that. There is no equivalent to this for the non-OpenShift case right now because the only tool that did this is now EOL. Which, which you're referring to is, is, is Pulp? Pulp 2. Pulp 2, Pulp 2 okay. was the only implementation of a mirroring replicator mass mass whatever for, mm -hmm. for OS trees. Um, nobody wrote anything else, and Pulp 3 doesn't have support for OS trees, so we got nothing. Okay. So um, I actually, that's all good points, and um, but I'd like to go back to Dusty's suggestion that um, we do some documentation about what you can strip out for resource-constrained deployments of OKD. I think that might be a nice, good first step. Not that I'm volunteering to write that, but um, as we get to GA, I'm just looking for new things to do. And I'm also looking for something um, that can be uh, leveraged uh, to, it, to compete against um, the Rancher K3 project as well that is not um, tied to Docker and some, you know, other other things along that line. So I'm, I'm I'm also trying to think about what we do next as a working group um, and, you know, what the use cases are, which is, Maya, you're a guinea pig, face it, um, for this topic. That's, that's okay. Um, so, Brett, so Maya, just, you've heard all this. Tell, tell us what you're thinking now that you've gotten the brain dump or a dump. Um, so I have been playing a little bit with Fedora IoT and played with the unpronounceable provisioning tool. Um, and it... You can add, um, it is still very limited. You can add the, the root SSH key um, and set a couple of basic parameters, but you can't really push out um, any of the, the OS tree stuff. I've been playing with Silverblue and looking at that mechanism um, and Fedora IoT. Um, with respect to Fedora IoT on ARM, 
Um, I've got a developer who's working right now on the U-boot and the, um, the primary bootloader or the, the first bootloader that we can configure from the, from the processor. So it actually lives um, external to main storage um, and we're adding functionality to it to be able to scan the, uh, the system image um, and confirm that it's a proper signed image. And if it isn't, has the ability to call home over the modem over Ethernet to download um, an image, um, which would really help for the you know first provisioning and bootstrapping process. Um, if you know all of the the baseboards can say, oh right, I don't have an OS, I'll go get one. Um, so we're we're looking at that um, as a the the provisioning and the and the management is really the biggest problem. Um, so whether or not we need a full feature K3 or K8. Um, is probably heavily debatable, um, but we do want to be able to change, um, add, you know, add things to the the single node cluster or or the the single device, um, add services, delete services, um, and the management and or the monitoring of those services is also important because that determines billing. You know, if you're doing loads of of age um, detection stuff because that's important to you, you know, we're going to charge you for that. And we're not going to charge you if you don't care about gender detection. So um, the or you know whatever whatever the business cases are for the particular modules that we're running. Um, so knowing how much compute that takes, um, if it's using the TPU or not, um, if you're using an accelerated version, um, the configurations won't change dramatically. Um, you know they'll change maybe once a week or a couple of times a month. Um, so, um, and there's no, you know, it's not like a, a giant, you know, web app. There's no need for for horizontal scaling or vertical scaling. It does what it does. Um, so the IoT and the OS tree model may be perfectly sufficient, um, so long as we can add, um, you know, containerized devices where we don't have to worry about dependency clashes. Um, I hate PHP for all the different versions that have ever come out. Python, I'm not really enjoying much more. Um, so, you know, and, and things like that, and, and wherever little bits of obscure source disappear and come from, I want those in a container. I don't ever have to want, worry about rebuilding them. Um, so, you know, I see some heads nodding, and, and I, I, you know, I, it's a familiar story that I've heard at every tech conf about, you know, apps and, and their evolution and or devolution and self destruction. So, um, you know, that, so the you know the provisioning, the scaling, the the resource monitoring, and you know the management across a fleet. Um, it's you know it's it's what Neil was describing about the replication and the um, you know the the getting the base level OS done, installed across everything. Um, if that tool is now disappearing, then then that's slightly worrying. So uh, Charles joined us. So um, you walked into a, an interesting conversation, Charles. Um, so everyone, everyone who joins late is going to go, "What the heck are we talking about here?" So oh no, I know. I think I'll just well prepared for what you're talking about. So, Charles, do you have a magical do-it-yourself solution for mirroring OS trees? Oh, that's. Ask me next week. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, come I, on. I thought I'd just throw in some more context here to uh, to really make it uh, difficult to follow. <laughs> uh, so, um, so Fedora IoT and Fedora CoreOS are related, and we want to move them closer together. Uh, right now, there are some subtle differences, though, uh, which I'm not sure how that would affect um, using Fedora IoT as an OKD base, for example, because in, in Fedora IoT, uh, we run the ignition stage um, in the real root on the first boot, while in Fedora CoreOS and Red Hat CoreOS, we actually run it in the Inadram FS. Um, so uh, we want to move all of that closer together and make it a coherent story also with Silverblue, but that is unfortunately a little bit further out still as well because of priorities. Um, but yeah, I, I do expect that there, that'll be easier in the future to sort of um, interchangeably use Fedora IoT and FCOS and maybe 
Fedora IoT will kind of become the the arm spin of FCOS, even though I think Peter Robinson won't like that, and we will have to uh, change things in, in FCOS. Um, so yeah, um, and there will be some changes in the Fedora uh, in, in the Fedora CoreOS world as well uh, to sort of align that in the future. But that's nothing we can do today or tomorrow. Um, it's like a long term thing. Um, and I don't want to promise too much here, but it's definitely on our, you know, uh, on our radar. It's just not something that's um, that's a super high priority right now. Um, but it would. So I'm I'm not sure how how easily it it can be done to sort of uh, switch out FCOS with Fedora IoT. If we uh, have or once we have the FCOS um, ARM builds, um, that will be much easier, of course, to to just use FCOS for that platform instead of uh, using IoT. I think eventually um, it's a goal for us to not have uh, separate ARM distributions, uh, but just have one Fedora IoT that is also the Fedora Core OS. Um, but yeah, we're not there yet. Um, so just throwing that in there to make confusion complete. Yeah. So I think, uh, well, on the 13th, we'll have another AMA session with the FCOS folks, um, and Dusty threw his name um, and uh, and if you want to reach out directly to him, he's the community manager for FCOS. Um, and so it might be a good connection for you, Maya. I still like, I'm going to keep going back to circling the drain, um, Dusty's suggestion about creating some documentation around um, what what is a minimal viable OKD deployment or wh what things can you remove um, one, because it, you know, I am, I'm always going to put my cards, it gets me closer to a K3S, um, or is it K3S, K38, or whatever, K3S. K3S. K3S, um, you know, com competing thing, um, maybe. Um, but it also, it starts to inform us, and maybe what we can ask of Maya, too, is to look at that and see what else, if, if we've dropped anything, she might need for this kind of IoT deployment, or there's even more that we deeper cuts we could make. Um, so I uh, just, you know, I, I think that once we get to GA, which I know is, you know, not until the 13th, the 15th, the 20th, whenever. Um, Somebody's saying dates now. <laughs> oh, you missed it. You missed it. You missed Christian it. Christian said a date. I'm like, nah, you're not oh, talking God. dates. Yeah. Christian yeah. said July 13th. Oh my! No, he did not. He did not. He said the fifteenth, and then I said we do a, um, uh, a another OKD for a GA AMA on the twentieth of July because I'm betting things will slide again. So um, so I'll book us for I'll pencil us in and Charles I'll invite you as well and everybody here uh, to come and join us for that. Amy makes an excellent point, though. Christian never specified what year that was. Right. It could be the year 3000. That's true. Exactly. A long time and then dust to the wind. Just wait for it. Yeah, just <laughs> wait for it. It's coming. Right. Um, so anyways, uh, we might get a T-shirt that says Achievement Unlocked. Um, as opposed to, I think we just, I think at this point it's probably well deserved at that for, yeah, for one so of those figure out what I, I finally figure out how to order t-shirts so that's like uh, yeah just asking other folks for advice well back in your original point a, a minimally viable okd would would also um, make it e make it more approachable for folks that are that are doing like code ready containers right if we could build a code ready containers okd version, that was even more compact so that you didn't have to have a, you know, an Alienware workstation to run it. That um, would be yeah, nice. That would... <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's also a real good, you know, community slash outreach opportunity here, which is very close to what Maya's doing, which is there's a whole lot of uh, very cost friendly, uh, fun hobbyist type boards like Raspberry Pi or the all of the stuff from uh, the Pine 64 folks. You know, if we could effectively deliver something ARCH 64 based that could run on something with with four gigabytes of RAM, you know, there's an opportunity there um, to bring a lot of people in that might not have otherwise been able to 
try out OKD. Yeah, I think, yeah. you know, I kind of like, I like the way we're talking about this now. And when Diane was first mentioning, you know, like, what can we cut away? My first thought was almost, can we invert this and say, you know, and I, I feel like this is something that's missing in OpenShift Container Platform as well, but like, can we show a documentation or an architecture that says, these are the core components you need to make it, and this is how everything fits together as you build it, you know, because even looking at OpenShift Container Platform, it's, it's really difficult to figure out, like, how do these pieces fit together? You know, what is this operator doing that? You know, so I think starting to build that map so that someone could build the core pieces and then start to figure out how do I plug this in? How do I plug that to me would be really valuable. Yeah, it's unfortunate that we don't know how OpenShift is actually put together. Um, We're getting, uh, you know, I'm, in the, I'm in the middle of this and I barely understand how it's put together. What are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, no, that, I mean, that's the, the putting it together part and, and we have a few um, constraints that will probably crop up in, in um, sort of more IoT or distributed applications. Um, we need to speak to um, the underlying hardware. You know, we need to be able to talk to the, the CSI camera interfaces um, and be able to put stuff out on the HDMI output. Um, and with the, the TPU module or an FPGA, those are connected via um, a PCIe channel. So, you know, we need to be able to talk to the underlying hardware and have support. I know that, you know, um, NVIDIA Docker has been around for ages, so you can run you know, Docker apps on NVIDIA GPUs. So it's not new, but it is something that needs to be built up. Um, and, you know, the ability to run container apps, coordinate them, update them, um, add and delete them, and have them talk to native hardware, that's that's my starting point. And then, uh, and then something, and, a, and then a really nice web app um, to be able, you know, for the customer to say, right, I want this, I want this, I want this, go compile it down, deploy it onto a device, and then, you know, watch all the statuses of all those devices and for, you know, the accountants, make sure that all the billing is done appropriately. Yeah, and Christian just popped a, um, an operator. This, that's going to be our answer to everything. There's an operator for that. Um, <laughs> that's the, uh, so it, in, is the SRO going mainstream, though? Because I had, I had heard that was kind of like an experiment. So is, it, is that actually going to graduate or? What? What? Who wrote it? I thought that was. Uh, I have. I have no idea. Yeah. Actually, it's called the special resources operator. It's like a way to manage um, things like kernel modules and stuff like that that you might need on the host. Uh, it's been developed in collaboration with Nvidia, I think. Mm -hmm. um, that seems so like the scary yeah, part. Like, right. Like yeah, my understanding though, Dusty, was that Zvonko had originally put together the SRO and that we were going to. Uh, eventually transition over to NVIDIA's operator. Mm. Are we going back to SRO now? I think we're SROs uh, going to be more generic. So, like, technically anybody could take and make uh, an operator based on this and okay. manage uh, things like kernel modules. There's an OpenShift enhancement for it. Um, let me see if I can grab a link. My cache is probably just stale. Point as well. and while, while and there was a time when that SRO was just looking at NVIDIA stuff, yeah. but now it's like, yeah, it identifies any special hardware and then runs the operator. Yeah. Honestly, that's the freakiest thing I've seen, and I don't know how much I'm comfortable with the fact that there's an operator that just, you know, kind of messes around with kernel modules and does weird things with hardware initialization. It's already bad enough when you're working with the kernel directly. Like, I don't know if you want to add operators to this mix. It's freaky. It's freak. But this is how this is how we're enabling like GPU workloads and yeah. NVMe other types of NVIDIA drivers. <laughs> that would be that would be so nice if they were just open source. But yeah. Yeah. And 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 in your dreams. Um mine too. Um the other news today that I was going to share with the group um, was the operator framework finally got the number of votes, and as of this morning, it is officially going to be an incubated product in um, CNCF. So we got one last vote in, and that I think it was announced on a, the TOC mailing list. It hasn't been publicly announced anywhere, but as you know, is that a good thing? 
That is a really effing good thing. Um, we have been trying. Why? Why? Because um, one, it's it's a pattern for um, for 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 operators that is has is becoming sort of a standard for it, and the OLM and the SDKs are in wide use, um, and we need. Um, and this is me with my red hat on. We need to get more external eyeballs on that um, workload so that it's not, um, you know, so so that it's not a red hat only effort um, to maintain and resource it. Um, and we people have been asking us to do this for a long time. There were a lot of uh, roadblocks in the way, um, but um, with a lot of patience, we've been at this effort to get it incubated for, I'd say, what is it? June, probably last October, I think, is when the um, first time I touched the CNCF TOC and pushed the request out to be incubated. So it's been a long haul, um, and it's a, it's a good. It is definitely a good thing for operators. Period. It's a I'm pretty. So this also means that that transitions to the CNCF's governance model and contribution model with the CLAs and all of that crap. Well, um, yeah, I think you exchange that for the number of, of more eyeballs and sunlight sure. on what we're doing. And um, yeah, right now it's a very Red Hat heavy, shall we yeah. say, um, yeah. project. That'll change, of course, now if it's in CNCF, but sure, certainly yeah. don't love the extra paperwork involved. Yeah. yeah, but you wouldn't want it to, to become like Apache Cassandra and data stacks, right? You know, there there was an opportunity for Cassandra to be a much bigger ecosystem than it ended up being because it it really was controlled by a single entity. Yeah, I'm not saying well, but the thing and that that sort of proves that moving it to the CNCF doesn't necessarily imply that that's what'll happen, right? True. Yeah, like you just literally gave me the the counterpoint. It's like just moving it from from uh, from data stacks to ASF didn't fix Cassandra. They 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 use the ASF policies to control it even further. Now I expect that Red Hat is not so stupid as Data Stacks, um, and will not make the same mistake. But you know, it just because the paperwork says it belongs to somebody else doesn't mean it actually does. So, uh, and and the pa sometimes the paperwork is also enough to make people a little more hesitant than they were before. So like those are. The, uh, those are all things that you have to be careful about. Like I, I've seen a lot of recently TOC submissions to the CNCF. It's not like I don't sit there and watch all the things happening there. Kind of have to. Um, but like one of the bigger problems is that if a project transitions to CNCF, um, things have to be reverse validated for all the contributions, and that makes things very complicated. Um, for uh, for projects where people don't want to sign legal agreements or can't, yeah. and so that's ugly. Yeah, I totally understand that. Um, uh, yeah, it's I mean it's good. It's a good thing in general for the ecosystem, but like, yeah, paperwork sucks, and adding more of it does not necessarily make it better. Yeah. Yep, but um, a, a proprietary appearances or us being control freaks about something or being labeled that about operator framework um, has, I think, hindered even further adoption. So, um, you know, it's, what can I say? And I'm just happy that they're going to start giving, um, like at KubeCon and other things, we can have an operator con, um, you know, event, you know, set, like they have PromCom and things like that. So we can start building a bigger community, more open community about that. Um, the CLAs and CAAs and all those things are, you know, that's part of the CNCF governance processes. I can't do much about that. Um, so on that cheerful note, um, uh, and thank you for bringing, making a downer out of a good thing there, Neil. I'm just going to say that out loud. Um, <laughs> no, no, it's a good thing. But you know, like, it's a really good thing. But it's anyways. A good thing. It, just, it, it just means that... Uh, like it, the contribution model revol revolves, you know, going through CNCF modeling rather than the store, uh, the normal, um, more uh, free spirited Red Hat uh, model of contribution. Okay, 
So before we go, because we get four more minutes, um, Joseph, you have an issue, and I'm trying to track it down here that you were talking about that you're going to pop into there. Do you want to just mention it so you get on the record with the recording, which I'll post um, what it was that you were – okay, I'm going back in here. I'm just writing about a problem with mirroring operator hub by, but uh, I will open an issue for that. I'm not sure if it's a, a bug or just a misuse uh, from usage. It's uh, we, I will clarify that offline. Okay, cool. All right. Well, um, thank you, everybody, um, and thank you, Maya, for coming. What I, I'd like to do is I'm going to put in the issue tracker um, the idea of creating documentation on what an MVP of OKD would look like. Um, I think that it's a good conversation to have. I'll bring up, I'll mention it on the FCAUSE AMA um, so that people outside of the universe that we live in will, um, yeah, thanks Christian, will um, we'll get word up, wind of it and we'll see what we can do to um, move this forward because, uh, you know, we always need a challenge and GA is next and theoretically everything is just automated after this, right? The builds just happen. The feedback comes back, it's all wonderful, so we need something new to do in the OKD working group. Not that there isn't more work. Um, so anyways, thank you, thank you everybody for joining us today. I'm going to let you all go um, before my network goes down because it has been wonky today. So um, thanks again, and we'll talk to you all soon. And Maya, make sure you look up Dusty on Freenode IRC. Yep. Good for it. Good. Connections made. Perfect. Take care, guys. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.